Can I welcome everyone to the 19th meeting of the Local Government and Communities Committee in 2019 and remind everyone present to turn off their mobile phones. Agenda item one is consideration of whether to take agenda items four and five in private. Are we all agreed? Yeah. Thank you. That's agreed. Uh, agenda item two, the committee will hold its fourth evidence session on the non-domestic rate Scotland Bill. Today's session will be split into two panels. For today's first panel, I'd like to welcome Rachel Blair, Public Affairs and Communications Officer, Scotland Charity Retail Association, Stuart McKinnon, External Affairs Manager, Scotland Federation of Small Businesses, David Lonsdale, Director of Scottish Retail Consortium, and Mark Crothall, Chief Executive of Scottish Tourism Alliance. Thank you all for attending and for your written submissions. And I'd like to kick off the questioning by ask the, asking whether the findings of the Bartley Review Group and the subsequent draft bill represents a fair approach to non-domestic rates which will better support economic growth. And happy to have anybody start. Thank you, uh, convener. Um, must hold up our hand. We were sort of, if you like, in the vanguard of, um, uh, if you like, campaigning uh, for review of uh, business rates, and we uh, strongly supported, uh, obviously, the um, the work done by Ken Barclay and his group. Um, we didn't necessarily get everything out of that that we would have liked, but I thought I think there's a lot of uh, measures that came out of the both the, the Barclay um, report, but also in this bill that we can get behind and support. So obviously, uh, more regular revaluations. Uh, that's a big uh, thumbs up from us on that uh, agenda, and I can go into that in more detail as to why. We also support the um, effort to reduce the period between which um, valuations are undertaken and come into effect. So that's been uh, condensed from two years to one year. Um, there's more on the sort of business rates agenda that's not necessarily legislative that we'd like to see um, undertaken. I would point maybe to, to two aspects. One is uh, the large business rate supplement. Ken Barclay's report actually alights on this. It says that that should be um, parity with England should be restored by April of next year. Hopefully that's something the committee can can broach with Mr. Barclay when you speak to him later on. And the other issue, um, the sort of pretty fundamental issue, I guess, for, for us and for our members, uh, and they count for about a fifth of the business rates paid in Scotland, is the whole issue about the poundage rate and how onerous it is at the moment. So the poundage rate, for example, is at a 20-year high. Um, and that's, you know, it's accelerated quite markedly since the start of this decade. And, and that's a big issue for us. So those are lots of positives in this bill, but there's more still to be done. Thank you. Anybody else, Mr. McKinnon? Uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. So, um, you know, David's taking credit for the Barclay uh, review. I'll do the same. Um, you know, the first minister announced a review of business rates at the FSB's conference a number of years ago, and we were closely involved in the the Barclay review. And fairly early on, it emerged that uh, the bill was going to be focused. Uh, sorry, the review was going to be focused on modernising the current system rather than fundamentally rethi rethinking the business rates uh, system. And as a review aimed at doing that, we, we applaud many of its uh, recommendations. Now, since uh, Barclay reported, um, you know, there's been work to try and uh, put his recommendations um, into in, into practice. And this this legislation is one part of a jigsaw of, of measures, which we, which we broadly support. Um, the switch to a more frequent revaluation cycle should ensure that uh, rateable values better reflect prevalent local market conditions um, the you know I, I, and further um, other other bits and pieces in the bill we we, we broadly support um, what we would like to see the, the the Barclay review and the the focus on business rates as a consequence of the Barclay review do is to deliver a step change in the user friendliness of the business rate system. I'm sure many MSPs at the the last revaluation had correspondence from local business owners who who didn't have a good understanding um, of the rate system and the, the revaluation process. What we would like to see is a, a real effort to get every part of the business rate system working together to deliver a more user friendly uh, system. And th this legislation is a part, but only a small part, of, of delivering that. Thank you. Ms. Uh, yeah, um, so I'm here from the Charity Retail Association. Um, there are over 900 charity shops in Scotland, um, and we represent 85% of them. Um, so overall, we're supportive of the object objectives of the bill and the Barclay Review to simplify the system uh, for ratepayers. Um, 
we were pleased that the Barclay Review concluded to keep the mandatory 80% charitable relief for charity shops. Um, what we'd like to see um, is this, um, the significance of this is to be protective, protected. Um, we'd hope that local authorities or in this bill there'd be a consideration to up this mandatory relief to 100%. Um, the important thing to us is that the health of the high street is a key consideration in this bill um, for charity shops, we believe. Um, well, we think charity shops increase footfall to high streets um, and they also help to fill vacant units. Um, we have case studies, um, particularly in um, Margate in England, where during the recession we saw a lot of empty units um, and a decline of the high street there. Charity shops filled the, the vacant units um, and this allowed them to, to increase the footfall. And now Margate is quite a successful seaside um, destination. And so overall, we'd say um, it's important that the, the bill considers the, the um, importance of the charity retail sector. OK, thank you very much, Mr Crawdell. Uh, again, uh, thank you very much for, for inviting me along today. Um, I'm from the Scottish Tourism Alliance. Um, again, we, we welcome uh, being part of this process. We've been very active with our colleagues from uh, UK Hospitality and the Scottish Licensed Trade Association um, in representing the views and the concerns of the industry, who, despite, obviously, we've, the volumes of visitors we're enjoying, um, has uh, bringing with it many challenges and we're seeing uh, specific declines in incremental costs to business and that poses a, a big threat to many. We were uh, particularly um, grateful, grateful for the fact that um, the Finance Secretary uh, afforded a 12.5% 12 12 real term cap on, on the rates uh, last valuation as it was uh, and is extended again but for many that cap has actually now uh, become null and void due to the uh, state aid caps, etc. Um, as others have said, uh, we very much welcome the the, the uh, review of the frequency of valuation, uh, and I think in particular with the fluctuation of, of business uh, trends and trade as it has been. And the Aberdeen example was uh, a specific, uh, well, an obvious one to point to with the with the oil uh, in the impacts uh, on tourism business as well. Um, we have a, an issue, or I suppose a challenge for us in, in the sector in terms of the um, methodology of calculation of the, of the current rate system. Uh, and again, colleagues uh, within the SLTA and UKH and ourselves have been having a dialogue with others to, um, at the, I suppose, uh, the response from Ken Barclay to bring forward a, a proposal that may be more satisfactory uh, and fair to the future. Um, we're very supportive um, in principle, again, that it will sort of encourage that investment and entrepreneurship to take place. Uh, the industry needs to innovate and it needs to allow that flexibility to do it. So um, I suppose I can talk more about other issues or other concerns in a minute, but uh, in the in, in summary, with, as with others, uh, I think it's a good step forward, but uh, there's probably still more to do and discuss. Okay, can I ask the... There was two uh, recommendations that the Scottish Government rejected from the Barclay Review. Can, can I ask, do you have any particular views on them? That's obviously re recommendation 28, that all properties should be entered in the valuation role and current exemptions should be replaced by 100% relief. Uh, and that large-scale commercial processing on agricultural land should pay the same level of rates as similar activity elsewhere, so as to ensure fairness. Is that anything that you would have a particular opinion on? There was, a, sorry, if I picked up the, the start of your question, Kavina, there was another aspect that Ken Barclay recommended that the Scottish Government rejected, which was um, the idea of introducing some sort of out-of-town uh, rates levy and allowing councils to actually introduce that. And, and thankfully, the, the Finance Secretary uh, wisely came to the view that that wasn't a, an idea that uh, would be taken forward, and I uh, certainly commend him for that. I can happily go into some of the detail of that, but that would have, in a nutshell, added fresh complexity and cost, if you like, to the rate system, uh, and thankfully it hasn't progressed that. Okay, thank you. In, in relation to the, the point about all properties being on the, on the valuation role, 
um, I can understand the sort of the, the the purist argument that all property should be on the roll, so we understand where where tax is lost, where where where, where people are getting help. But on the other on the other hand, having in, been in discussions with assessors and with government, I know just how uh, slow and creaking the current system is. So to put additional pressure on uh, the assessors at this time that we're looking to move to a more frequent revaluation may not be sensible. And I suppose the priority for us would be to get this new revaluation cycle working more quickly o over uh, over other uh, other concerns. Okay, so thank you. Uh, we were at uh, the committee was on a visit on Monday to Kilmarnock and New Mills, and I want to put in the record of thanks to everybody who helped to organise that. It was a very successful visit. We learned a lot from it. But one of the things that came up was. The, the, the sort of cliff edge scenario with the small business bonus. We're, we were talking to one company in particular that was talking about he doesn't want to grow his business in the town centre because if he did go to a larger premise, he would lose a small business bonus and it would end up costing too much. So his options were to stay small or to leave the town centre. Uh, does anybody have any suggestions on, uh, on how that can be overcome? Maybe I can, mm. uh, I can kick off on that on that one. You know, the, the upcoming review of the small business bonus will be a great opportunity to kick around ideas for approving the current scheme. And um, we're hoping the review will come up with real recommendations about the best way to support smaller businesses in the rate system. Um, I think that at the last uh, Scottish government budget, um, we made representations to the finance secretary for an additional uh, taper between between bands. Um, of course, uh, successive uh, uh, finance secretaries have, have made changes to the, the small business bonus where um, there is a multiple property uh, um, band which was introduced by John Swinney when he was finance secretary, which, which was aimed at tackling that per particular problem. Um, as part of the, the Barclay review, we did make a recommendation that smaller businesses should be allowed to uh, keep their relief as they grew. Um, that if you did take on your your second premises, perhaps you would you would pay rates on that second premises, but retain your relief for the first. Uh, again, to try and soften the the edges of of, of that. Um, but at the same time, we recognise that we have to um, you know we can't necessarily ask for the the moon on the stick, and we have to uh, work within certain parameters. Um, I, I would say that you know trying to chew over these pretty complex issues about finding an optimum way of supporting small businesses will be you know, really important as we as the, the bonus review continues. Thank you. Uh, I'll just move on, and, and uh, I'm sure you can go back to that. Uh, we, we have got quite a lot to go through, so if we can just keep things as concise as possible, that'd be great. Alec? Can I, can I just quickly go back to something that was said earlier? It was about the user-friendliness of, of the system. I mean, what, what in your view needs to happen there. I mean, I assume that that's not legislation. Is it a resource thing? Is it, is it a change in, in culture within those services? What is it? I, I would say all of the above. Um, so, you know, I, I, I've worked for the FSB for a number of years and what was remarkable was the similarity between the last revaluation and the one before it, where lots and lots of businesses were caught unaware. Um, there was issues about data collection from the assessors. There was a sort of a, a political reaction at that at that point, um, and I think uh, you know an awful lot of these problems could be countered if we you know delivered a, a, a significant improvement in uh, in customer service. And one of the, the the troubling or one of the more difficult things about the rate system is there's lots and lots of bits of public bodies involved in it. So you've got you know all 32 local authorities. You've got the Scottish government. You've got the the, the assessors who are all uh, you know semi-autonomous, and what from a, an individual business owner should not need to be need to know all of that to, in, to interact with the the system, um, and what what we propose is a digital interface for ninety nine percent of the, the 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 cases. So but where businesses can submit rental data, they can pay their bill, they can apply for uh, reliefs. And you know, basically, to make it as uh, as simple to interact with the rate system as it is to, um, you know, pay a utility bill um, on online, you know, and and I think, but for that to happen, you'll need 
uh, multi-organizational cooperation and that's that's where the sticking point uh, can be because lots of organizations have multiple priorities you, you might not need legislation but it would be um, if if there are bodies which um, you know are, are are not playing ball then legislation might be a, a last resort um, on that on that front briefly then like Ali, I don't yeah. want you stuck on the one point so no no but I notice in your evidence, Mr. McKinnon, you described the admin system uh, in Scotland as old-fashioned, yeah. um, and you suggested that it wasn't old-fashioned el elsewhere in the UK. I mean, so what? I, I think from a committee's point of view, we're looking for ideas of, you know, how how things could be improved in the in this bill. Sure. Um, so the evidence from the assessors you know, highlighted that they welcome a change in the legislation that would see them allow allow them to communicate with ratepayers digitally, because uh, at present uh, they feel like they have to use paper-based uh, correspondence method. So that simple switch should help us move slowly into the uh, into the 21st century. Um, similarly, um, you know, what we see in uh, in Northern Ireland is the development of a digital uh, spatial portal for all property and land-based services. That looks like an excellent model. That wouldn't necessarily need uh, legislation to, to develop that, but if, it, if, it's, if there are legislative barriers to that sort of uh, model being, uh, being um, developed in Scotland, this would be the opportunity to, uh, to address those, those, those particular problems. Thanks. And certainly my experience trying to represent and support businesses at the last evaluation was exactly as you describe. I found it very, very difficult to get information and to get stuff to understand. But also at that point in time, it seemed that the hospitality, in particular pubs, restaurants, seemed to be disproportionately impacted. That's certainly how it felt. Uh, in terms of the numbers of businesses that were going out of business, is was that the case? Is there certain certain industries that are disproportionately impacted by by the the current system of rates, and is there something that can be done about that? Um, from I mean, from the sector as a whole. I mean, when we uh, were obviously aware of the the valuations coming around, the 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 level of shift. Uh, to the increased uh, valuation was so significant at less, unless there was a, an intervention, as has been, many of them would actually have been seriously uh, at risk of taking, putting the key away. Um, and there are those that still sit uh, with that concern because of the, of the current valuation levels that sit on the book. I think picking up on what Stuart said uh, around the simplicity of uh, being able to report data, I think the assessors were fair enough in saying that there's not enough um, data being presented back the other way for them to do their job was uh, was what was taken on board and has been taken on board. But going back to just the simple examples of getting the, um, the rate relief uh, on the cap across the 32 local <coughs> authorities, there was absolute inconsistency uh, in that process too. Some uh, local local authorities were absolutely uh, well equipped to, to act quickly and there were others that said that they just didn't have the software to be able to actually um, conduct the, the transactions or the um, adjustments as you would want. So all of that costs money to a business and all of that puts at risk that business staying um, alive. Okay. If I may, and I think um, one of, certainly for our sector, one of the great frustrations, if you like, about the previous revaluation period is that um, previously, you know, the valuations were undertaken at spring uh, 2008, which was, in a sense, the top of the market before we then had the financial crash. Um, and a lot of the sort of travails within the retail industry um, have been well known over recent years. So I think this sort of, it sort of underpins the need for actually for more regular revaluations. Uh, to be honest, that, that's not going to solve every problem. I've already said business rates, the poundage rate, and tax rate is too high. Um, but I do think um, more regular revaluations would actually smooth out a lot of the problems because basically you had a sort of seven or eight year period there where, you know, values were taken at one level and then when bills landed on the doormat, it's very understandable that some companies would have seen, some organisations in some sectors would have seen quite a change in their sector's performance. Uh, and obviously, well, I can't speak 
Mark can speak for the hospitality sector. Uh, some elements of that were, if you like, hot during that period and did well, and therefore there would have been differentials. Whereas for retail, towards the end of that period, um, actually it was quite challenging as, as well. And can I pick up on that point you made earlier about the out-of-town retail centres? Is, is there a, a balance at present between out-of-town? I mean, it would seem or many retailers in, in town centres would argue that out-of-town have a lot of advantages, car parking, etc. <laughs> Is the system fair as it is, or, or, or should there be another look at out of town? Um, we're always open to that. I think um, town centres have a tremendous amount to offer, but like businesses and sectors, they need to reinvent themselves. They particularly need um, a sort of compelling reason for people to go and visit and spend time and spend money. Um, I think all retail destinations uh, have been struggling of late. All have been uh, seeding ground, if you like, to um, you know the on online retail space. Uh, I was reading figures the other day that almost nine out of 10 people in this country have shopped online to some extent over the last year or so. Um, and that's much more prevalent in this country than it is in many places, for example, uh, in the rest of Europe. We're just more advanced uh, in a sense. We've uh, bought into the idea of online retailing uh, in a bigger way. But that actually reads across a whole range of other sectors. It's not just retailing. So, you know, buying holidays. I'm probably not the only person who's bought holidays online uh, in recent times. And we see that uh, as well in banking, financial services. We see it in terms of newspapers and, and media, estate agency and things like that. So the, the digital revolution is touching every single sector. And I think that's one of the strengths of the bill is that having more re uh, regular revaluations means that uh, the rating system, if you like, keeps up with changes, not just in terms of individual sectors and how they're performing, but also uh, changes as well in the economy uh, structurally. Given given the, the town centres in particular are really struggling, you know, you just need to walk around most, most areas of Scotland, is there more that this bill could have done to support town centres? If so what? So, um, so again, I think this goes back to my earlier point. So the bill is positive as far as we're concerned in many respects, but there's actually non-legislative action that is also required. So there's lots being done in terms of um, trying to get people to live in town centres, in terms of um, public realm investments. The finance secretary made an announcement about um, a town centre fund. All, all these things you know, are worthy, have a lot of merit, are positive. But at the end of the day, if it is too expensive for retailers and other businesses to invest in town centres, and I, you know, the poundage rate's at 20-year high, the large business rate supplement is double what it is uh, south of the border. If it's too costly to invest in a town centre, then you have a problem. So the, I think there's a coherence here. that the, the bill, an issue with coherence, the bill is just one aspect of it. Um, you know, we, we think there's a lot of merit in it. But there are other things that government can do. And that's not just the Scottish government, but also at a local government level. So councils, for example, for the past three and a half years have had the power to reduce business rates. I'm only conscious of three out of the 32 local authorities doing anything on that front. If, if, I, if I could come in on a couple of these points, just to return to the, the hospitality sector, you know, the, the rating of the hospitality sector has been a fairly persistent and controversial controversial issue. Um, what, I, what I would suggest is, um, ahead, ahead, that because it's been such a persistent problem, you know, is there an opportunity for Parliament to scrutinise the role of the assessors? You know, Parliament's historically been reluctant, and is this bill an opportunity to, ahead of the next revaluation to, to uh, at, at the very least, get the assessors in to evidence how they're coming up with a uh, rating methodology ahead of a, ahead of a revaluation? Um, if I can talk about town centres and high streets uh, briefly, you know, you know, FSB has long been a champion of you know town centres and high streets, and at the moment, it, a lot in a lot of town centres and high streets, it feels like independent businesses are fighting the battle uh, by them by themselves, and we've seen a large number of public sector bodies and large businesses leave our our high streets. The banks being a prime example. If we want these places to be successful, we need to get a wide range of organisations back into our town centres and high streets. 
get, getting the right the right uh, rates package is one element, but it's only one part of a of a wider mix of of policies. I'm, again, I'm certain that the upcoming uh, small business bonus review will look at place based uh, issues and that some of the it might not necessarily need to be attached to this bill that it might be able to to, to be uh, look looked at elsewhere. I think that it, it's you know as we consider you know it's just over five years since the town centre. Uh, action plan and review um, and it would be you know again it's time to revisit high street policies which rates is only one part of it so is, is the panel generally in support of the small uh, business bonus scheme and the review you'll be contributing to I mean, I, I think just echoing what Stuart and David have said, I mean, from a tourism point of view, a tourist comes to visit um, to experience place. Um, we're in the process of starting to shape our, our future tourism strategy for Scotland beyond 2020. And all of the traveller trend is saying that they want to absorb and consume. And we've seen the change in, in behaviour through how people choose to stay uh, and, and uh, experience um, destinations. And you look at the failures of some of the major... Um, restaurant chains, Jamie Oliver's, and all of these other operators who've fallen off the high street, who are offering an alternative. Um, but then you, we've got a lot of independent restaurateurs and real creative talent in Scotland that are actually now seriously questioning whether or not they're able to afford to, to operate in these destinations because of um, the rate structure as is. And I think for everything that's been discussed so far around the, the, the frequency of revaluation and allowing those businesses to flex. But equally, we have out of town uh, experiences as well in many of these destinations too, which uh, draws and attracts um, the tourist uh, to visit. So, um, but I think uh, we have uh, asked uh, on several occasions the Scottish Government as well, you know, to really get a grip of what the assessors are actually doing in terms of the methodology and the evaluation process. And some of, excuse me, some of the challenge back is, is through lack of data, but there needs to be uh, a much clearer understanding for the industry as, as much as the, the assessors and government to get the right system that works for the sector on a, on a regular and more frequent basis to, to really prompt um, investment, you know, because uh, not being able to plan ahead is uh, clearly something that uh, wouldn't incite that, uh, in, encourage that investment. And I'm just going to finish on this, but just, sorry, just, just in terms... Like OK, on. thanks, Anne. Um, yeah, I'd just like to add that in terms of long-term planning, um, the rates relief system that charity shops currently get of 80% um, does sort of leave an uncertainty um, in some sense. There's a, a postcode lottery um, in the application of the discretionary re relief. Um, only a third of local authorities in Scotland grant the full 20%. Um, and our members tell us that like, the removal of this 20% or where it doesn't exist, this can result in lower performing shops closing. Um, for instance, in rural areas or in um, disadvantaged communities. Um, so what we're looking for is a system where there's more, more consistency across the local authorities that would allow for charity shops to invest in high streets. Um, as it is, um, this can be quite difficult. OK. And just, just to finish on this, convener, but I mean, I just think it's interesting that certainly my experience of trying to deal with assessors was one off. Um, they, they were certainly not helpful, uh, to put it mildly. And there seems to be that concern that, that's coming through. And I think that's important that we note that in terms of a report, uh, that you do think that's an area that, without even legislation, something needs to be done. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much, because you've, you've clearly made your views there uh, already. And on Andy? <coughs> Thanks, yeah. um, you've, um, I mean, a key part of the, the bill is the move from five to three-year revaluations, which I think you've all said. Uh, Rachel, I don't think you've said anything on this, but um, the others have said this is, is, is helpful. Um, can you just say briefly why you think that would be helpful, particularly in the context that any revaluation is only as good as the data upon which the value is based. And therefore, if there continue to be issues about the capturing of data and accurate data, is a three-year revaluation going to be any help? Certainly, from, from our perspective, obviously, as uh, alluded to um, earlier, and is also in our evidence, we, we strongly support more regular revaluations. There are a number of benefits uh, that accrue 
uh, from that. Um, also in the bill, um, there's um, a provision in there about extending the period of time that ratepayers have to, if you like, provide information to assessors. I think the dates are something like going from 14 days up to 56 or something like that. So firstly, I think that that should help because I think one of I suspect one of the challenges for ratepayers is when they've only got a, a couple of weeks of window to provide information. Then it's a case of we'll just we'll just try and appeal. So if they've got more time to consider uh, what information is required, uh, I think that's that's a positive. Theoretically, more regular revaluation should mean that um, over a, a relatively shorter period of time, uh, ratepayers will. Um, come up to speed and make sure um, that their valuations are in line with, or at least the information they're providing. There, there's more of an incentive, if you like, to make sure that they're providing the information because they're going to be revalued on a more regular basis. You know, you know similar to, to, to what what David said, yes, you know, uh, there will be a challenge. If the current system's not working very well and we've got a five-yearly revaluation, a three-yearly revaluation model means we really need to sharpen up uh, our, our act. And that's one of the reasons we, that we support the that we support the switch. That it will, you know, it will mean that ratepayers become more familiar. It should mean that it, it you know, it, it necessitates both the assessors and local authorities to look at how they deal with the the revaluation um, process. Uh, and those measures in themselves would be helpful to make the system a little bit more user friendly. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you know when we look. At of what's happening around us, um, you know, being able to flex um, as need be in this in, in what is a relatively short period of time. You know, I, I use the example of digital, which we, in 2012, when the current tourism strategy was written, the word digital only featured in it three times. And here we are, you know, even at 2016, it was the number one issue for all of us. Um, and I also think there's, there's less chance um, that, you know, the, the jump or change between um, rates uh, valuation will be as significant as it has been or potentially could be if, uh, over a longer period. So we certainly support it. Um, we are broadly supportive of a change from five to three years, um, but would ask that the relief um, could be confirmed within that three year period. Um, because at the moment, the relief is confirmed on a yearly basis. Um, and again, this makes long term planning difficult um, for our members. Um, we'd also want to ensure it was carefully considered so it's not an unnecessary burden to smaller charities in particular. Um, and because of that, we are broadly supportive of a digital interface, which should hopefully make the communications better, which you know our, our members have also told us that communications can be quite poor around revaluation times. Um, the final thing we would ask um, is that the revaluation times could perhaps be aligned with the other revaluation re re times in the UK, um, which would help a lot of our members. Okay. Moving on to uh, some of the evidence, um, Stuart McKinnon, you've given the Federation of Small Businesses. Page, um, the third page of your, second page rather, you say that FSB is concerned regarding the decision to introduce a number of changes to the proposed legislation at stage two reducing the opportunity for scrutiny. What do you mean by that? We haven't got to stage two. So well, I understand that there's going to be moves to uh, detail the changes. The government's going to detail changes to the appeal system um, at, at, at stage two as it enters the parliament. And that the details of those changes to the appeal system um, will be important to, uh, to, to ratepayers to understand how that will, how that will work. And I think that we, I, I understand that as part of the uh, being part of the Barclay Review Group. So you, you, you have advanced sight of intended government amendments. I, that, well, I have no. Uh, no, I have no. I have no advanced sight. But I, I understand that that's the intention. Okay, that's interesting. Um, you also go on, and you've already touched on this. The FSB has long argued that Scottish Parliament should have a role in scrutinising the activity of the assessors. Of course, the assessors have always been independent because they're they're making professional judgments on, on on valuation but you mentioned the methodology of valuation i think you mentioned stuart in particular the hospitality section of course different types of property have different valuation methods so what are you really suggesting there are you saying that the for example the methodology used to value hospitality premises should be subject to parliamentary scrutiny and therefore all these practice notes should in effect be in secondary legislation or something else. At the at the very start, I suppose ahead of a revaluation, um, it would it might be useful to get the Scots Association, Scots Assessors Association, above this ahead of this committee, 
uh, or another another committee and say what preparation are you making ahead of the next revaluation? What consultation have you had with key industries about your uh, about your your methodology? I, I, I would uh, at this stage I would presume that the assessor would still be independent to make up the methodology, but there should be a role for Parliament to ask how they're preparing for the revaluation. So they're accountable not to Parliament, but to local authorities who, who own the joint valuation board. So surely that scrutiny is better done at local council level. Well, having entered into discussion with local authorities about their relationship with the assessors and with local local councillors, th that that particular relationship isn't well understood and isn't well, well understood consistently across the country. OK, yeah. fair enough. And and, you, sorry, Andy, but you say it isn't well understood. <coughs> uh, Andy's... Reading of it is that it's local authorities that are in charge of them. What is your understanding? I think it is local authorities, is, but it, it, in, it, it, individual um, <coughs> councillors and uh, and officials in in local authorities don't often have a good understanding of the role of the assessor. In two thousand five, when primary evaluation appeals was ongoing, the assessor repeatedly told me they were not uh, accountable to the council that they were an entity within themselves. So I think that's something we need to look at. Um, also in your evidence, um, Mr McKinney, on holiday homes, you say that FSB broadly supports measures to address the misapplication of the small business bonus scheme, especially when applied to non-business recipients. Um, given that the small business bonus scheme is not really about businesses, it's about small non-domestic rated property, and some of those properties are not businesses, they're 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 in the public sector, or bowling clubs or whatever. I mean, are you actually saying that if there's no commercial activity operating from a non-domestic property, it shouldn't be eligible for a small business bonus scheme? Well, you know, we're broadly supportive of the, 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 the specific move in the, in the proposed uh, legislation to end our as they describe it, as a loophole for, for, uh, for holiday homes, where holiday homes, or sorry, second homes are applying for the small business bonus. We don't think that's uh, some, that's from our point of view, that's a misapplication of the of the relief. We think that, you know, some some people have highlighted as the MSP offices are applicable for the small business bonus. You know, given the name, I'm not sure that that would necessarily be a, be the right application for the for the relief. Again, I think this is an this sort of issue will be looked at during the the small business bonus review. But we broadly support of the move to only apply the small business bonus for premises where small businesses are being run. Okay, that, that's interesting. I mean, MSPs offices are are just offices as far as the rating system is concerned. Doesn't they matter who who occupies them? Um, and just a, a couple of further questions. Um, so for the retail consortium, um, you say that you're firmly opposed to repatriating control over the poundage to local authorities. Um, given that this is a local tax, should they not have control over the rate? What's the problem? You've, you've read our submission correctly. Um, we are uh, opposed to it, uh, if for no other reason than we fear that um, ratepayers would be treated as a cash cow. Uh, conscious at the end of the day that council tax bills have just gone up by three to five percent well in excess uh, of inflation um, as i put in our uh, submission uh, the poundage rate the tax rate has gone from basically 41 percent to 49 percent uh, since the start of this decade it's about to go up even further a 20-year high uh, i'm not necessarily convinced that local authorities would be, do a better job uh, if you like of keeping down uh, the poundage rate um, I suppose we'd have a, we'd be more amenable if councils had actually picked up on the local discretionary rates relief that I, I talked about earlier on over the last three years and actually uh, used it as well. Uh, have you not put your finger on the key thing there? Is that they've got the power to reduce uh, rates, and indeed many of them probably would 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 like to to stimulate some business, but they also need the opportunity possibly to increase them as well. In other words, they need the full flexibility in any tax system. We've supported flexibilities in the rate system uh, in terms of um, the business rates incentivisation scheme, in terms of um, the business improvement districts and the levy that they uh, are able to charge uh, as well. And as I say, we supported the local discretionary rates relief, um, but hardly any councils have, if you like, bothered their shirt to use it. Um, and if they, if they were to make a convincing case that they would be able to keep down 
um, business rates. Um, they would be on a, a firmer footing, I guess, when it came to trying to convince the, the, the business community that they should actually have these responsibilities. But as I say, none of them actually used, or very few of them have used their power to keep down business rates. And I'm not entirely convinced um, that they would, they would endeavour to do so. OK, I'll leave it there, can you? Thank you very much, Annabelle. Thank you, Mr. Um, some of the uh, uh, issues concerning uh, procedural matters. Um, a moment ago, I can't remember which panel member referred to the uh, time period within which the information notice is to be required to be returned. I, I don't know if it was Mr Lonsdale? Yes. yes. Uh, so it's gone from 14 days to proposal of 56 days plus then the 28-day appeal. But we have heard evidence to the effect that people think that that actually is too long and it should be an initial period of 28 days. What, what would your views on that be? Uh, well, Somebody, uh, I'm, I'm not, sorry, I've not followed uh, the rationale for the 20 days. Um, as I understand it, um, the 56 days or whatever the figure was, was in uh, the Barclay uh, Review. Uh, they obviously uh, studied this for 18 months or whatever, uh, and then that's been accepted by Scottish ministers. So um, I'd like to think on that basis, and there's been you know, some consideration and thought into it. I I'm not sure who's make who made the 20 day proposal and why they were advocating that, so it's difficult to, to comment. I, I think, uh, well, it would be in the evidence received but, uh, by the committee, but uh, I, I guess it would be because people feel that that would allow the process to be accelerated in a reasonable manner, uh, in that for, for most, uh, providing the information required would not necessarily need to take 56 days and it could be, the whole process could be speeded up a bit. So it's actually in all people's interest to. Uh, perhaps have a shorter uh, deadline for providing the information notice, uh, the information required by the information notice. Can I guess that is the rationale. Yeah, c c uh, clearly a balance has to be struck. Um, uh, so, you know, giving people sufficient time to, to respond, um, but also making sure it's done in a sort of quick and expedited way. I, I guess one of the sort of practicalities I would uh, throw out there is that certainly for Retail is one of these industries where if you've got a good idea and a good proposition, you can scale it up. And if you've got uh, physical premises, you're often in a number of different council areas or indeed operate on a pan GB or a pan uh, UK basis. Um, and so you probably have lots of local authorities uh, to deal with on a whole range of issues uh, as well. And one of the sort of the... the the challenges that's come up through the structural change in how we shop over recent years, um, but also the sort of cost side of the equation is that um, there, are, there are relatively few people who, within retailers of scale who are, who are there to deal with some of these issues. So I, I fully appreciate there's a balance to be struck, but giving them more time as the bill does to respond to requests is eminently sensible. Anybody else have a view on the matter? I'd agree with that. Um, more time for our members to respond to information request is, um, I think, something that would help help them provide what they need to. I, I, I yeah, the same. I think there's a huge amount of pressure on a small business owner and operator at the moment, and the bulk of our sector obviously fall into that category. Uh, and whilst you know an expedient um, resolution or conclusion is, is is always in the best interest. Uh, I think the ask of, of many at the moment is to try and do a lot more and as we well know that many more of the independent owner operators are very much now at the sharp end of having to run a business because of the labour challenges we're faced with as well. Um, so um, the balance uh, is, is the right approach and if it get, does afford a little more time I think that would probably be welcomed but I would like to think that the, the, the business owner would probably look to conclude sooner than the, the deadline time. Uh, you know, there's, as other people said, there's a careful, careful balance to be struck. I think, the, the, I suppose, what the policy intention is to get more data returned, and probably the more important thing is for a step change in the user friendliness of the system. Rather, so rather than um, when does this bit of paper need to get re returned? Can I return it online? Can I correspond with the assessor digitally? Um, rather than you know a deadline about when this bit of paper needs to be returned, that's the more important thing. So thank you for that. Um, in terms of the uh, recipient of the information notice, I understand that the intention at the moment is to widen this out so that the assessor could uh, seek uh, information further to these information requests. 
uh, from uh, any other person who the assessor thinks has information. Do you have any views on that? Is that to be welcomed or resisted? Or I'll go. I'll go first. Yeah, I think that's broadly to be to, to be supported. <coughs> uh, you know, I think specifically where I see this working well is better information sharing between the public sector. So, ra so you you stick an extension on your. I don't know, your garage or, or, or whatever, um, and the, the, the information is automatically shared with the assessor between the local authority, and that doesn't necessarily happen as a, as a matter, of course, at, the, at present. Similarly, uh, in an ideal situation, we, it would be excellent to see information sharing between tax authorities, so between HMRC and the, t and the assessor, so that businesses are not submitting the same data to the same tax authorities. Now, I also understand that this, these, this will give powers for the assessors to get uh, additional data from people like landlords, um, rather than going necessarily to the tenant, um, and I think that is also to be to be welcomed again if it uh, in increases the amount of data, the quality of the of the data um, as well. You know, the, the only thing is you don't want you you, you don't want to, to put undue burdens on on businesses, and hopefully a sensible sensible approach can be can be struck. OK. Um, uh, with regard to uh, an issue that was raised uh, a few weeks ago on legal privilege, there was a concern raised by some that, um, although it's not by any means clear that that is the intention of the bill as drafted, that this somehow could be widened. Um, has that been brought to your attention thus far? So <coughs> the normal understanding of legal privilege is it extends only to communications with your solicitor uh, and it wouldn't then cover you know, any suggested part of a lease document that was deemed to be confidential. It would just simply be the normal meaning of legal privilege. Has this been an issue that has um, caused you any consideration thus far? I mean, it was raised uh, just by the by a couple of weeks ago. I thought it was quite an interesting uh, issue. It, it's an interesting point, which I've not, I've not considered at this stage. OK, you might want to refer back to the evidence because uh, I, I, I suspect if, if it is... Uh, not to be understood in its normal context, you might have some, your members may have some uh, thoughts on that. Um, in terms of the consequences of not providing information, so at the moment, first of all, the criminal penalty has been removed, and be interesting to hear your thoughts on that. And secondly, because some people feel that it should be put back, uh, and, you know, because there has to be a, a sufficient uh, uh, imperative to provide the information and to provide the information fully uh, and expeditiously. Uh, and then in terms of the level of civil penalties, again, the view has been expressed that actually for some of the people involved, this would be simply pocket money, it'd be nothing. So there would be no imperative for the large players to pay any heed to this really because the civil penalty attaching is, is de minimis. Any views on that? Um, well, I would say in terms of uh, charity retail is that any Sort of fees or penalties would not be welcome in the sector. Um, we would be concerned that this would be taking funds away from key charitable causes. Um, I, just I mean, on to but the penalties, this, this, this would be if, if there was a failure to comply with the information notice. Yeah, I, I, would, I would say that... Um, so any penalty then? What would be the for, imperative for, to comply? I, I think um, for penalties... Um, I, I mean, I can look into this further um, and report back to the committee, but I, I would be under the impression that charities um, uh, would 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 um, be inclined to to um, follow 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 the the guidance as it is um, and ensure that the, the penalties weren't weren't something they would face. It would not uh, any fees for that would take away from charitable funds would not be would not be something that's for. Well, present, there's a, a criminal penalty, so, I mean, what they're doing is replacing a criminal penalty yeah, with... It's the with proportion, penalty. I'd say. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. I, I think... You know, going back to um, what Stuart was saying around having a system that's simplistic to enable businesses to contribute and input their information is probably ultimately the, the number one um, biggest opportunity to change culture. And arguably, the, the recent revaluation and the challenges that we're faced with is possibly because some businesses have found it difficult to communicate, respond, etc. I think there's a recognition as well that the data that's currently being gathered is um, limited, and therefore um, valuations are being based on, on, a, on a small 
uh, sample set. So um, having a culture of acceptance that everybody contributes and there is access to information out there, but through a portal that allows it, that it's simplistic, it's governed, it's, it's protected, um, then absolutely, and why, why shouldn't you know, there be a penalty uh, for, for folk who choose not to comply? Um, what, that, what that should be, I don't know, um, but certainly uh, from the conversations I've had, um, there needs to be you know, a fair approach taken, um, and therefore to enable that to happen, then there should be a, a level playing field. Uh, yeah, if, if I could just follow that up. You know, the, a more frequent revaluation cycle necessitates more data being gathered by the by the assessors. Oh. You know, we had you know in discussions I've had about that. You know, you need some sticks for uh, for for more data. You need some carrots for more data. Of course, the business groups are going to go like, give us the carrots, uh, make the system easy to use, and you'll get better. Communicate more effectively with the the, the business community, and you'll get better data. You'll get more people returning it. Really, you know, we would like to see these uh, fees and fines used as a last. Resort resort um, and you know for for a business you know you can understand that at the moment when a business gets a form from the assessor who they've not heard from from se for seven years or they might only be in uh, in operation for four that they don't understand what this form and it is and its and its significance and if we can really improve the the communications between uh, the business communities and the and the rates authorities, we can get that improvement in data collection without hopefully resorting to widespread fining of the of, of the bit of the business community. I, I think in the the financial memorandum for the for the bill, I was slightly concerned to, with the, some of the figures that were uh, that were ha highlighted in the in the financial memo where they suggested that the, the, they tried to estimate the amount of revenue from from fees and fines, and they did that on current. Uh, non-provision of data rates you know really we would hope that the provision of data rates really improved dramatically before we start handing out handing out fines i hear what you say i mean it's, it's just you know obviously the, the the legislation has to set the level somewhere uh, and you know the point has been made that if you have a, a business with a turnover of millions of pounds to, to set the the maximum penalty uh, at either 500 pounds if not on the the, the role, or I think it's around 7,000, 7,500. I mean, that's just a drop in the ocean. What is the stick there to the large player to get on with it and provide the information? And I mean, one of my colleagues will get on to anti avoidance issues in due course, but you know, these are issues that we have to wrestle with. So as we look at our report, so there's a strong argument for any fees and fines to be proportionate with the smaller, smaller businesses pay paying a, a smaller share of say their rateable value than, the, than their larger counterparts. I'm sure David won't agree with me on that, on that particular point. Um, Being proportionate <laughs> is a good basis. I'm not sure, yeah. I'm not sure what, why turnover suddenly comes into the mix. Why, why not profits or some other metric? I'm not sure what the relationship, relationship is between uh, the point you make and turnover. Well, uh, the point I was trying to make, Ms Lonsey, was simply that if you have separating out your small business from your uh, you know, multi-million pound business, a, 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 a penalty of... Five hundred pounds potentially, or seven thousand pounds, is really you know who cares? I mean, it doesn't matter, does it? So it's no incentive to uh, provide all the information that's been required. And this is important as we go on to anti-avoidance issues. But I'll leave that for a colleague. One last uh, area of questioning, convener. Um, a, a moment ago, Rachel Blair mentioned the issue of fees, and obviously um, there are proposals to introduce fees for appeals. So that's one issue. And the other side of that is the potential for retrospective increases to rateable values being the other issue, obviously two very important issues. Any comments on either or both of them? So, again, switch to more frequent revaluation cycle necessity, a massive drop in appeals. Um, and I understand at present only 8% or so of appeals are actually successful. And in the experience of our members, Unrepresented businesses are almost never successful uh, in in the, in their uh, in their appeals. Um, what I in, in relation to fees and fines um, for sorry fees in association with lodging an an appeal. You know, I suppose the, the the argument again. I would say if the fee structure was proportionate, perhaps tapering down to zero for the very very smallest businesses. And it results in a significant improvement in the in the appeals process. Then that's something that the uh, that the that the business community could or the small business community can accept. But with with this new fee, income has to become 
has to come a significant improvement in, uh, in, in customer service. Any other views? I'd echo what um, Stuart's just said. I think it, proportionate is one thing. Um, services, you know, uh, what you pay for is you expect to get back, you know, a, a good service within the timeline um, and it, affordability um, at different levels of, of scale of business. And I, again, would sort of just pick up on what David's point was around on, on profit as opposed to turnover. I think you've got a lot of, you know, different sized businesses uh, of making potentially a lot more money on the bottom line than the, the larger businesses proportionate. So there needs to be a, an agreed way of uh, approach to that. Differentiated fee structure depending on criteria to do with size or turnover or profit or whatever? I, I think so, absolutely. I mean, it's, um, it's you know, there is a, such a wide scale of business base there as well. And how do we, you know, we want to encourage uh, future investment and growth, et cetera. We don't want to penalize. Um, but at the same time, like anything, you expect a service back um, to be given. Uh, and there's a, a umpteen different discussions of different services that are currently provided that many would question as to whether or not they're actually worth the value that they're paying. Being, uh, they're paying uh, in return. Expectations are, are high. Thank you very much. We're going to, we, we will move on to the anti-avoidance yeah. now. Thank you. Uh, Alexander. Thank you. We've already touched on some of the loopholes uh, that are currently in place. Uh, and within the, the bill itself, there's a section about tax avoidance uh, and, the, and the whole process of how that is working. So it would be good to get a view from the panel as to whether the anti-avoidance measures in the bill, uh, which deal with empty premises, uh, are strong enough uh, and they will close some of these loopholes, or do you still see that being an ongoing problem? For our part, we, we've not really uh, touched on that in our written uh, submission. It's not something that members have really sort of, um, you know, brought to brought to our attention. Uh, it's not been one of their sort of top issues, to be honest. Um, just simply not aware of it being a systemic problem. It might be for others, but not for us. We're, we're in a sector. Um, I mean, your your colleague was talking about profits and. Um, it's been quite difficult to get profits if you're a retailer in the last few years and the, the, the profitability of the sector has halved over the last five years. It's about, it's a low margin business, it's somewhere in the region of about three to four percent. Um, so it's different to an, a, a wide range of other uh, sectors, but we're not conscious of, uh, of an issue. But there are some retailers who do not uh, use their premises, they, uh, they end up uh, ensuring that, that the business isn't actually alive and running from that location, uh, but there is a, an attempt to ensure that, 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 that the business uh, is being utilised or, or it, it appears uh, that the, the owners are somewhere else or the, the building isn't being used or, or various options to that. So there are loopholes that, that businesses are, are actually at the moment uh, ensuring that they benefit from. Uh, and within this whole bill, we're talking about trying to clamp down on some of that to ensure that there is this uh, change uh, and that the avoidance is, is going to be taken on, on board. Certainly don't have a problem with, um, you know, if, if companies or, or other organisations, ratepayers are, are believed to be uh, avoiding their responsibilities, don't, certainly don't have a problem with them clamping, with the government and agencies or whatever clamping down on that. The fact, the fact remains that, um, you know, at the moment, the structural change within retail means that, um, you know, a lot of retailers have come out of retail premises. I think the figures were published last week um, that there's been an 8% reduction uh, in the number of shops in Scotland over the last 10 years. So, um, you know, retailers are in the business of making money. Um, where they're not making money uh, from a particular unit or site, uh, they hope to try and exit that, either change it round so they can make money or try and exit it. And one of the shifts we've seen in recent times has been towards much shorter periods of leases than we've had historically. Now, that could potentially come back if the economy uh, improves um, and various other factors, but um, in the, they're not in the business necessarily of wanting to, to, to shell out lots of money for units where they're not trading. Um, and, and obviously we've seen quite a lot of, as I say, retailers exit prom uh, properties over recent times. So I'm, I'm not conscious of it being a particular issue. Anyone else in the panel have a view? Yeah, I, I suppose you, you talked about empty properties. You know, we support, we broadly support the move for the small business bonus no longer to apply to empty properties. We think that, again, you know, that, that's a tweak that, that we, can, we, can, we can support, we can live with. Um, you know, the, 
you know, generally speaking, you know, our typical members not necessarily going to be involved in complicated tax avoidance uh, tactics. Um, and so again, we can broadly support the uh, the, the the measures in in the bill. Um, you know, I think that the, the the financial memorandum also highlights evidence from England that in the rate system, actually, the level of tax avoidance is what one percent of uh, of the, the the amount on the roll. So, I think in comparison to other taxes, it's perhaps not as much of a problem as other taxes. But it's good that local authorities will have. Uh, the legal powers to try and address some of these problems. One of the other points that we make in our submission, though, is that it's all well and good that for having new legal powers, but the if we're going to, if we have to have a well-resourced rate system, if we if local authorities are going to have the powers to check whether the existing reliefs are being used as they should be. Exact issue. Uh, you know, the, the, there is the potential for a financial burden on local authorities in managing this situation, uh, and that may have an impact as to how effective and efficient they are going to be in ensuring that the, the rate situation uh, across the piece and across the business sector is supported. So, what do you, do you have a view on on what would happen in that situation uh, if there's an added bonus and there's an added burden onto local authorities, and that may then take some time because we know that they're doing having to do a lot. Uh, more uh, with less uh, and the number of staff that they have and the resources and the manpower that they have. So there's an impact on all of that uh, that could impact on your own sectors. I've got real sympathy for the, the rates teams in, in local authorities when I've, I've chatted to them because they're like often there's point zero point eight full time equivalent staff are in, in quite significant uh, local authorities. Probably the way I would think about it is that if you automate as much as you can so they're not dealing with paper forms or and they're not dealing with the the the, the, the you know the, the the machine runs itself except when something breaks and they can go in and they can spend their time as professionals checking where appropriate checking out having the time to look at the data to look at it, things that don't quite look right rather than processing paperwork um, that would that would be my suggestion any other views no Everyone else content. Thank you, Kevin. Okay. Thank you very much, Graham. Yeah, um, I've just got uh, three quick questions um, to sort of mop up on some things that have been said and, and, and some of the evidence that you've given. So, if we could, if we could start with the charity re retail association, Rachel, you um, mentioned this postcode lottery where some charity shops get full relief and and some just down the road sometimes don't. What is it you're, you're asking for there? Um, we are seeking for local authorities to grant all charity shops 100% rate relief. Um, so to take the 20% and make it 100. Um, we are concerned with the inconsistency across local authorities. Um, what, what, what we see is um, members who are unable to, to plan long term. Able to? Plan for the long plan. term. Um, because of potential changes to removing relief relief. Um, recently Murray Council chose to remove the twenty percent discretionary relief from charity shops there. Um, so this is of concern to the sector and area. And that's just one example of what what like how how changes can happen quite quickly, um, which we find isn't really sustainable. And I and I wasn't really clear on when you when when you said in your evidence that you know you could have one one shop presumably in the same place, gets the relief and another shop just down the road doesn't. Is, is that because councils are, are zoning this relief? Different councils have different policies. Um, again, this is it's up to councils what to do. So some will grant it to all charity shops. Um, some will set a specific criteria. Um, so they might say the charity has to be local or, um, I don't know, has so many number of shops you know it's up to the council to decide and that's the 20 percent um at the moment is it really is up to the council what what that policy is um yeah so your suggestion for the bill is that there should be a mandatory 100 percent okay and if i could uh, then turn to the fsb um and you mentioned in 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 your your submission uh, you mentioned the appeal system um, and how it could could be moving into the tribunal system. And I wonder if people have any thoughts on that. Anyone can answer this, I guess, about whether that's a good thing or not. So 
I think the the move to the moving into the tribunal system sort of predates, uh, you know, Barclay. Um, and, you know, I think, uh, again, our members' experience with the appeal system has not always been brilliant, um, especially if you're an unrepresented ratepayer that you've not forked out for pro professional uh, property um, advice. Now, whether, whether the move to the tribunal system it's probably going to be a much more formal uh, process, which has its drawbacks. But at the same time, it's likely to be uh, more like a uh, more professional. Um, but again, uh, again, my understanding is that the move to the tribunal system. How, how is it not professional now? So, in in, in my in our members, uh, the feedback that we've had from members is that. It, the, their experience that they can have with tri with the the current appeal system can vary from place to place. There can be an, an inconsistency, um, and um, at present, the way that the um, the assessors discharge their appeals is at individual assessors' discretion, um, and all of that is you can only really understand that if you've. Um, if you've tried to follow the rate system for, for some time. Um, and, and I suppose, again, the lay business owner is not necessarily that, that familiar and moving it into the tribunal system will hopefully provide better information about how that system works for those without a specialist understanding. What, what I would highlight is the move, the, move, the move to the tribunal system also necessitates fewer appeals. So um, again, if, if there's still the same volume of appeals, at the next revaluation, and we've moved into the tribunal system, we're probably going to be in tr trouble. Um, and I think, again, it, one of the things that I recommend to this committee is assessing the ro robustness of this changeover to the more frequent uh, revaluation cycle. Yeah, yeah. And just so we're clear that cur currently, um, if you appeal, you go, that's dealt with locally. It's a local appeal. So, yes, but there's, oh, there's a sort of, at, at present, there's almost a. Um, a pre-appeal stage where you can enter discussions with your uh, with your assessor, if you, which again is basically at the discretion of individual uh, assessors, and then there's the the formal uh, appeal system, and again a share of the appeals lodged are fall off the the system before they ev eventually get get seen. Um, and the data about those numbers is, can be a bit foggy. Um, only those that actually end up in the final stage are counted in the official statistics, by, uh, as I understand it. Right. Does anyone else have any thoughts or experiences of the appeal system? Can I just ask a question on, on, on the point you raised there? You, you said that uh, the pre-appeal meeting is down to the assessor. Does that, are you suggesting that in some areas you don't get the opportunity of that? Or are you suggesting that it's the outcome that is down to the assessor so most of these discussions happen at the point of obviously at the point of revaluation so i can only speak to the experience at the last reval revaluation obviously people get their new and so many people phone up their assessor and say i've got this new um this new valuation through and they say uh, and different assessors have had different approaches now i know that the assessors have their own program of reforms which they're working to to try and standardize their approach um i don't have obviously the, the test of that new new approach will be at the next revaluation but historically um in our experience different assessors have taken different approaches to this discussion period um at the point of people getting draft rateable values oh, that's fine and does anyone else have any uh, thoughts? I just, again, just echo that. I mean, examples of, of some of our members have said, you know, that pre-appeal has literally been a phone call, um, at sometimes even in the car, and a discussion has been had. So, you know, giving it that, um, I suppose, a security of a last last stop through a tribunal um, process is maybe the way to go forward. But, but in real terms, you know, the volume of appeal has to diminish, um, and that potentially could happen with electronic approach. Okay, um, so one uh, final question, and that's um, based on something that Scottish Retail Consortium said in your evidence, which I thought was very interesting. Um, and you mentioned the fact that uh, business rates are paid on car parking spaces, which they are. And that's why you'll often see on business parks in particular, car, par car parks are actually closed off, so you can't use them. 
um, so therefore that business rates aren't paid. Um, and you mentioned it cuts across another piece of legislation, which we're not here to talk about, which is the, the transport bill and potential workplace parking levy. Um, you describe that as double taxation. So if we can just stick to business rates and not the workplace parking levy, are you, are you suggesting something needs to change there? <laughs> um, well, um, in fact, I was in front of a, uh, one of your fellow committees a few weeks ago on, on the issue of the workplace parking levy, and the fact remains that if, as I understand it, councils are, are set to get this power, if the legislation is passed, uh, if they do introduce it, then they'll be, they'll be charging, as you say, a, a, a levy, uh, if you like, on um, a part of the, the valuation rule that's already paying um, business rates, so that's double taxation. Uh, there may be other examples of double taxation in our in our both devolved and reserved um, taxation system in the round, but that doesn't seem to me like a particularly sensible uh, way forward. I think there are a number of other uh, concerns that we have uh, about the workplace parking levy, um, but adding to the burden uh, is probably not the most sensible one. As I said, uh, the poundage rate, the tax rate, is at a 20-year high, um, and a number of these uh, parking spaces, uh, depending on what property uh, they're actually building they're associated with will already be subject to uh, the large business rate supplement as well which as I said is twice the rate in Scotland uh, than it is south of the border. We're in the fourth year of the large business rate supplement having been doubled and over those four years uh, ratepayers in Scotland will be paying uh, an extra quarter of a billion pounds uh, for retail alone that's somewhere in the region of 45 to 60 uh, million pounds extra that they're paying because of the doubling of the large business rate supplement. Okay, yeah. right, thank you very much. Kenny? Yeah, yeah, the UK government, of course, charges VAT on taxes such as tobacco, alcohol, you know, fuel duty, so it's actually quite a common occurrence on very large scale, and we all probably pay quite a huge amount of money, actually, in, in terms of these double taxation. That doesn't mean it's, it's right, but it isn't an uncommon. Uh, I want to just touch on a couple of things, uh, convener. Um, so, good morning, panel. First thing, if you meet yourself, Mr um, Lonsdale, in your submission, I found uh, paragraph 25 particularly interesting, where you say that ministers are forecasting that the annual cash value of rates reliefs will have increased by £150 million over the four years until 2019 uh, 20 to £750 million, a 27% uplift. The value of the reliefs as a share of the total take for business rates rises over the same period from 21.6 to 26.9%. And you go on to say the system only seems to function through myriad exemptions and reliefs that continue to grow as an overall proportion of the total amount paid in business rates. The use of these sticking plasters underlines the need for more regular revaluations. So you earlier talked about, you know, um, the poundage being at a 20-year high. So it seems, you know, bizarre in a, in a way that we've got rates relief are a kind of, you know, a record high and we've got poundage at the highest level for 20 years. So do you feel that what might be a better way of addressing this issue is to have fewer reliefs and a lower poundage overall, and if so, what reliefs would be removed? Um, well, certainly, so um, one of the sort of um, aspects of the bill is, of course, bring, is um, putting on a statutory footing the um, business growth accelerator. And actually, our colleagues uh, down south have picked this up and are saying that in England, uh, there should be something very similar to this as well, but uh, over a three-year uh, period in order to allow firms to recoup um, the actual cost of you know, commercial property investments and things like that. So we, ex you know, we, we fully accept there will be um, rates discounts, um, there will be uh, reliefs and things like that, but I think the broader principle um, about having more regular revaluations and keeping down the overall um, poundage rate or tax rate is a sensible sort of starting point for looking at all of these things. Yes, there'll be cases where you you know you do have to have reliefs, and I think um, Stuart was talking earlier on about there's, there's going to be a, a review of the small business bonus um, scheme, for example. We we've been supportive of that, but I think it's it's right and proper that from time to time you do look at individual reliefs and check whether the rationale is still is still pertinent uh, and whether um, you know they're delivering value for money clearly Barclay did that um, and we've been broadly supportive uh, of that 
it seems that the poundage rate has been increased to, to take account of the number of reliefs. What about your, yourself, Mr Kinnan, or Mr... Um, so I think we, you know, FSB strongly supports the small business bonus and the help it gives uh, smaller firms. You know, the most recent uh, survey work we've done um, on, on the small business bonus um, suggests that about a fifth of, if the, if the scheme was to be abolished, a fifth of the recipients would amend their growth plans, a fifth say they'd cancel planned investments, and about a fifth said they'd, they'd close their doors completely. So going into the, the small business bonus review, we're going to stand up for our members that currently get the, this important help from the, from, from, from the Scottish Government. Um, I would highlight that there are, there are a small number of our members that, that pay the large business supplement and that there might be work there to ensure that you know sm smaller or me medium-sized firms, you know, don't accidentally fall into that uh, into that you know tax uh, that tax bracket. Um, I think that you know we've tried to be as constructive as possible, talking about tweaking the the, the small business bonus, su suggesting, for instance, that it shouldn't apply to empty properties. Trying to be as constructive as possible in ensuring that it goes to the right the right businesses, and we'll continue to take that approach. Mr. Crowther, would you? Um, yeah, I mean, I think there are we, uh, many of our population are obviously small businesses, and again, we support the review of the of the scheme. But we would, have, as you've seen in my submission, caveated it quite heavily around uh, recognising the importance of you know tourism businesses in the communities uh, and what they do for, for the for the wider economy there. I think the the other side of the coin uh, to consider is we've we've long term argued that the, the fifty one thousand pound uh, figure of rates, uh, rateable value uh, in many of the hospitality sector actually doesn't necessarily mean that's a large business um, and therefore you know they they tend not to operate in that scale so maybe some of that um, uh, looking at uh, at the scale uh, across the the valuation um, measures but uh, you know Overall, we have to, I think, going back to what's been said several times this morning, the frequency of the valuation process will allow, uh, hopefully, that not to, um, you know, require such uh, incrementals. Um, but the small business bonus scheme review, again, is there is there needs to be a fairness across the whole approach, um, and I think there are, um, you know, it's it's timely for that review, and is is that incremental poundage funding that small business bonus scheme arguably you know to what extent would that make a significant difference um, but justifiably the review I want to go on to you with the next question so obviously you can answer the question that we've already asked but uh, just uh, as I asked this one he said um, at the beginning of your evidence that there's 900 charity shops in Scotland you say about a third um, are eff effectively get 100% relief uh, but of the 600 remaining, how many of those actually get support from the Scottish business, the Small Business Bonus Scheme? And, and what's the average, do you know, of rates that are paid by the remaining shops? Do you know? I don't have the exact figure, um, but I can try and get it for you and send it to the committee afterwards. Um, what I would say is that uh, rates relief is um, essential to the vitality and the viability of the charity retail sector. Um, which provides economic, social and environmental benefits. I think these benefits make the relief a, a, a cost, um, cost effective for the taxpayer. Um, in 2012, when the Scottish Government did the business rates review, um, it showed the, uh, the charity shop rate relief cost £9.3 million, um, which equated to only 1.7% of the total business rates relief applied. Um, I'm not sure how small business bonus fits into that, um, but ultimately what we, we, we would say is that um, rates relief um, for us is, is vital to our ongoing. You also talked about footfall uh, increasing because of charity shops, and I think that's undoubtedly true. Um, the, the FSB and others might actually argue that you know charity shops run by volunteers who are getting 80 or 100 per cent relief are actually providing unfair competition to some of their businesses. What, have you, has there been any assessment done by ever by the FSB or the charity sector on well, that? What we, would, what we would say to that is um, that charity shops are not in competition with other high street players. They are a partner um, and. You know, our, our shoppers want to see variety on the high street, and I think that's what charity shops provide. Um, another way to look at it as well is that environmental benefits provided by charity shops. Um, I think they can now play a position in 
developing a circular economy, um, maybe for consumers to look at more ethical ways of shopping. Um, and so I think it's important to make sure that we're not looking at charity shops as enemies or, you know, um, competition. Um, they're just another partner on a high street. Okay, is that the view of the FSB? Um, broadly, yes. I think the, the you know charity shops have a role in our high streets and our town centres. But on the other hand, there's no doubt when you go down a high street and there's a huge number of charity shops, that feels like a that symptom of a place that's being you know that's on the on the decline. But I, I would say that the way that we we fix that is having more. Uh, organisations competing for those units on the high street. It's it's about getting other players rather than just independent businesses and charity shops. It's about getting big business in the public sector back into the centre of our towns, taking those spaces that at the present independent shops and charity shops are, are, are trying to fill. We were informed when we were in Kilmarnock that, 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 that some um, uh, providers of retail space have allowed charity shops to move in actually rent free simply because they cannot get other businesses and they do actually add something to the, the high street. Is that something you would broadly agree with? I mean, I mean, Rachel in her, in her, in her submission said that uh, as a result of charity retail, 330,000 tonnes of textiles were kept out of landfill, reducing carbon emissions by 7 million tonnes, for example. So there are other benefits, but do you see that? Do you see there's a, there's a, that they do uh, allow empty spaces that otherwise would not be um, taken up to be to be filled and well, so certainly for, so you know the retail industry is changing uh, and will continue to involve and certainly if uh, you, you or I were a landlord uh, you may you may be uh, out with your your uh, political uh, political hat um, it's very understandable for landlords to look to others to try and take on some of this space um, and you know if that adds to the footfall in the high street or a town center that's great but if, you know the fact is that public policy in the round, both at a Scottish and a UK level, um, is, pushing up the, is pushing up the cost of having a store footprint, uh, whether that's the premises or indeed, um, you know, the cost of employing people. Um, and obviously, you know, in an era where there's profound change going on, uh, consumer spend is weak in terms of its growth and costs are rising. Something has to give, and as I said earlier on, the number of shops um, has, has decreased. Uh, if I may convey, I'm just conscious of your time, um, and uh, no doubt you'll, you'll seek to wrap up. You, you mentioned, and this is that it, there is a there is a link. Uh, you mentioned at right at the outset about um, the visit to Kamarnock, and you met firms concerned about the cliff edge. I think you put it in terms of uh, small firms rates relief. There is a there is a cliff edge of sorts as well when it comes to the large business rate supplement. Um, it's at fifty one thousand pounds rateable value, and as soon as you go above that, um, you it, because it's a slab tax. You pay the rates on every pound, straight, you know, whether your rateable value is zero or right up. So there's another issue there, and as Stuart said, and as Ken Barclay said in his report, that, that tax actually applies to many small and medium-sized businesses. The, the name is a bit of a misnomer in terms of it just being large organisations. We did hear from a company that actually was directly affected by that in Kilmarnock, who would want to stay in the town and employ an additional number of people, but they felt that because of lack of tapering in that slab, they were unable to take that actual risk. Sorry? You'd been paying attention earlier, Kenny, because I brought it up. Yes, I know you did bring it up, but just he specifically mentioned it, so it was part of, the, so it was part of my questioning. Okay, thank right, you very thank much. Thank you, thank you. Okay, uh, I, that, that's uh, the session complete for just now, so I thank the panel for attending today's session, and I suspend this meeting to allow for a witness changeover. Thank you very much.
For today's session on the Non-Domestic Rate Scotland Bill, I'd now like to welcome uh, Ken Bartley, former chair of the Bartley Review of Business Rates. I appreciate this is a late agenda change with Mr Bartley's attendance confirmed just yesterday, and we're really grateful for you to be, for being able to attend today. So we'll move on straight to questions from the members, and I'm going to ask Andy to kick off the questioning, please. Thanks very much, Convener, and welcome, Mr Barclay. Thanks very much indeed for coming along at, um, at, at short notice. Um, broadly speaking, to begin with, do you, do you feel that the recommendations of your review group have been broadly put into practice, both through the non-legislative measures the government's announced and the, legislative, the primary legislation that they've brought forward in this bill? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure um, that's really my position to respond to. What I would say is that with over a 14-month period, uh, we consulted with many people and determined what we thought was in the best interests of the brief that we were given by Scottish ministers. Uh, I haven't been involved with it for the, for the last two years, um, and I guess it's up to Scottish ministers to determine how much or how little of the recommendations that we made are brought to, to bear and how much of it comes into through primary legislation. Okay, fair enough. Um, there were two recommendations that the government has not decided to take forward. One of those was recommendation 28, um, where you recommended that all property should be entered in the valuation rule, currently agricultural land, foreign military bases, embassies are, are, are excluded. Um, presumably you still think that's a good idea, but the government's not taking it forward. Have you any thoughts? I mean, uh, my, 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 uh, the view of the committee, the view of the, um, of the panel at the time was that um, we felt that it was important that um, all property was put on the register. Um, I, you know, that, that's whether, whether that, that, that was certainly the view of the, uh, of the panel at the time of the review group. Um, what it would have been able to have the public see was the extent to which uh, public subsidies were given to certain elements of the uh, the industry that we highlighted uh, and it's entirely for the government to decide whether they want to to pursue that or not okay and the other one was the large-scale commercial processing on agricultural land um which the government's decided not to take forward. I'm just wondering what, what kind of examples, without naming individual businesses, but what kind of examples were you looking at in that kind of recommendation? To give you an example, it would be that if a, an abattoir was um, was on um, agricultural land, it would be exempt from paying tax, but an abattoir on a brownfield site would be subject to tax. And in order to level the playing field, we felt it was appropriate to make that recommendation in our paper. And would the same uh, would the same situation arise with, for example, I don't know, an ice cream factory or a biscuit making factory? I guess if agricultural land was being used for that purpose, the answer to that question would be yes. Okay, thanks. And the other, um, I mean, you had formal recommendations, but you also had other issues you were uh, considering. In Annex C, uh, C seven in your review, you had an interesting recommendation ensuring that every ratepayer pays something. Uh, you don't go into what the something should be, but can you just elaborate on the principle behind that it, it came, thought? It came, about, it came about as a consequence of many small businesses that we spoke to, feeling that there had been a disconnect between um, the understanding of what non-domestic rates were for. They were to contribute to, uh, to, to, lo to the provision of local services. Um, and and you know, a description that was used to me when I was on the road was that some uh, high streets had become rates deserts. Basically, nobody paid any domestic and non-domestic rates on them. Uh, and many of the small businesses we spoke to were, were said they would be prepared to pay something towards the, uh, the the local services that they were effectively in receipt of. Um, it, we didn't ever get to the point of... Um, of determining what level people were comfortable with, but um, that, that's what that's what many of them many of them actually said. One of the challenges that we found when we were going through this was, well, what what is a reasonable amount, and what are the costs involved of the collection? If collection act, the cost of collection outweigh the amount involved, then you know clearly that's a false economy, and ultimately we felt that uh, it wasn't something that we were able to recommend to to ministers. It, it wasn't something you were able to recommend because you 
couldn't reach a resolution of the cost-benefit analysis rather than that the principle was in doubt? The, um, the, we were unable to determine whether or not the, the cost-benefit analysis made, made any sense. And that, and that ultimately is why we decided that it was important that uh, the, the overarching review of the um, small business relief scheme was, was a far more important way to go about it. Very much. Okay. Thank you very much, Andy. C can I ask you, uh, Mr. Bartley? Yeah, and you'll have heard the previous. I think you were in for the the previous speakers when they were talking about this about their their views on the your calls for a large business supplement to be brought in line with that in England. Could you give me your rationale for that? Um, I, I would say simply that um, our our view at the time was that. Um, it was important that Scotland was seen and had been expressed by ministers that Scotland was the best place to do business. And one of the ways that we could recommend that that be done was by reducing the large business supplement down to the same level as that which was in England. OK, thank you. And um, you clearly, uh, the, the review was a while ago, but have you taken a view since the time passed, since the review about developments in local taxation and economic context, needing a further review, reform uh, non-domestic rates? I think all, all I can say to that, Convener, is that I stand by the recommendations I made in 2017. I haven't been involved in any way, shape, professionally or privately in rates since that time, and uh, I, I, I was I discharged my duties to the best of my ability. The, the, OK, the, the, I've got one question here about day nurseries the, the approach the government's approach to implementing relief for day nurseries and the perceived unfairness that non-profit nurseries co-located in school grounds still pay rates where did, have you got a view on that but i'm afraid i don't convene um i'm, I'm not able to respond to right no that's that's not an issue at all uh, alec you wanted to come yeah, in could I just ask you a quick question the the last panel that we had talked about the the friendliness or otherwise of dealing with the, with the, with the, with the whole process and the system. And as I said to them, as an MSP, I found it quite difficult trying to help small businesses in particular when you contacted uh, the council and, and just understanding that. I mean, have you got any view on that? Because they seem to suggest that actually if you put in some kind of, I don't know, improvement service, and, and customer relations, you could actually get a better dialogue. There are a number of issues that we felt could be improved, and we've highlighted them in, in the report. Um, I, 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 I had understood that some of those were now in a consultation process between the end users and, and the process through which they go with assessors. And uh, more than that, I really can't, uh, I can't add, I'm afraid, Mr Riley. Graham, do you want you some questions around? Yeah, um, I'd like to thank you for coming in as well, uh, Mr. Barclay. I mean, I know it was um, very, very last minute, but really, really appreciate you being here. Um, one of the uh, areas that we've been really looking at as a as a committee, and it stemmed from one of your recommendations, uh, was the the idea that we would remove rates relief for in, independent schools. So that was your idea. And where, can I ask, first of all, where that idea came from? Yes, this, certainly, of course. Is this, is this coming on? Are you hearing me appropriately, or do I...? Yeah, OK. Um, the, the idea stemmed from the fact that one of the things, that one of the guiding principles that we adopted was the issues of transparency and fairness uh, and making sure that people were on a level playing field with one another. And it was quite apparent to us that... Um, since uh, state schools were paying rates, it was entirely appropriate that um, independent schools should pay rates too. Now, I, I, can, I can anticipate the next question, which is, um, well, perhaps uh, the, in, the, the state sector shouldn't be paying and the, and the public sector shouldn't be paying rates. But when we, we, we spent some considerable time with members of the public sector, be that the health service, the prison service, the uh, Scottish Water, the... Uh, the um, the enterprise agencies, we asked them the very question about whether rates should be paid by the public sector, because it's a fundamental point. Our people argued that it was effectively money just going round in circles. Um, to, for context, it's about 15% um, of the total rates bill, I believe, about a billion pounds as of the, the time that we um, uh, 
we presented our report to ministers. So we, when we spoke to the prison service, the, the prison service said, well, we didn't think it was appropriate for us to pay rates. And then the conversation evolved into acknowledging the fact that there were private prisons in competition with the state prisons, and private prisons paid rates. So therefore, it was entirely appropriate the prison service reflected that they also paid rates so that we could create a level playing field, which was one of the, the, the principles that we adopted at the outset. When we spoke to the enterprise agencies, likewise, they said, well, we need to pay rates because we are talking to businesses that pay rates and therefore it would be entirely inappropriate for us to be paying, uh, not to be paying rates when the, the very businesses that we are uh, dealing with are, are equally paying rates. When you talk to Scottish Water, they said, well, to all intents and purposes, we're, we're, uh, we're treated as a, as a private company, albeit in state ownership, um, and it's entirely appropriate that we should pay rates. And so the story went on. If you talk to the health service, they recognised that they were in competition with private hospitals. Private hospitals pay rates and the, the health service pay rates. And therefore, you get back to the point I mentioned at the outset, which was, well, should the schools be paying uh, rates? Well, the, the answer is, if you're treating everybody equally, since the state schools are paying rates, it was entirely appropriate that the, um, the, the independent schools also paid non-domestic rates. Right, except that the independent schools are classed as charities. And if we're to be consistent across the char charity sector, um, you, you wouldn't discriminate uh, between one part of the charity sector. In this case, it represents only half a percent of the, of the charity sector uh, and, and, and the rest. Um, and the upshot of this idea is that we actually do, do that. Uh, and in, in Oscar's evidence to us, they describe this as creating a two-tier charity sector. Um, so first of all, would you would, would you accept that that if, if this goes through, we would create a two-tier charity sector, um, and that has implications potentially for charity law as well. Um, I think I could all all I can do is reiterate what I said in one of the earlier questions. It's really for ministers to make their recommendations to this panel and decide what was appropriate to put, be putting into a bill that requires primary legislation. I think I've fulfilled my duties in, in making that rec recommendation. It's for ministers to determine whether they uh, they want to, to proceed with it or not. Well, it is, but except the idea came from you and, mm. your, and your your review. So, do you accept that your recommendation, if it if it if it goes through and it becomes law, will create a two-tier charity sector. I, I'm, 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 not, I'm not convinced about that. I, I looked at it on the basis of fairness. Um, we looked at it on the basis of fairness, and we felt it was appropriate, and I felt it was appropriate, to, to level the playing field between the, uh, the state sector and the private sector. But, can, can I ask Mr. Uh, if uh, the schools, private independent schools, didn't pay rates, would that not be creating a two-tier education system or a two-tier rate system? Sorry, Dick. If, if for example, uh, the, the independent schools didn't pay rates, would that not then by itself create a different education, a fairness and education system or in the rate system? I think that was my point. I was trying to level the playing field between the, uh, the state sector and the, and, and the private sector, uh, and therefore that was the recommendation that we made. So, that, so you could argue that there's a, an un level playing field at the present time, which I was trying to, to do something about to, to endeavour to, to level that playing field. If, that, if that's OK. Um, so given that this, that, that this does have um, big implications for the charity sector and potentially for charity law, um, I presume that you spoke to the charity regulator, Oscar, in this. Is that, would that be correct? We invited we were invited to Oscar for their comments at the outset of this process, and as far as I can recall, I don't think they they replied. But you 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 did have witnesses in, um, so did did you actually invite Oscar to come in? In fact, we 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 asked Oscar to present um, uh, to, to to we we invited Oscar by email to uh, to submit uh, a proposal to us when we were seeking evidence from multiple uh, individuals and uh, organisations at the outset of the process in 2016. They didn't respond? They didn't respond. OK. Um, so we've heard, we've heard uh, evidence, which you won't, you, you won't have heard, I accept that, but we, we've heard evidence um, from some players in the independent school sector that 
they're on the brink. You know, they're, they're, they're struggling. And if this was introduced, it could actually push them over the edge and you could see schools closing. So given that that's the case, with the benefit of hindsight, would you be, change your mind on this? Because I'm sure that's not, not what you want to happen. I, I'm afraid, Mr Simpson, I can only respond to the basis on which I was instructed to give my brief. It's entirely inappropriate of, of what I think now and relative to the changes that have taken place. My responsibilities were um, to submit this report to ministers uh, by the uh, late summer of 2017. I did so. And um, if, if my opinions changed in the intervening period as a result of, um, of changes that have taken place in the wider economy, then and there, there will be multiple changes that have taken place, it's really not my place to come back and, and suggest that alternative arrangements should be made. You, you must have an opinion, though. I mean, it's a, it, yeah, as, a, as a result of something you've recommended, uh, potentially schools could close. You must have a view on that. I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm afraid it, it's... I, it, I'm, being, I'm going to be drawn into something that I think is inappropriate, and you know, I, I would say, convener, I've, I've made my point very clear, um, and uh, you know, I, th I think it's, it was entirely appropriate for me to make my opinions known at the time. If circumstances change, it's really up to government to take account of the changes that have taken place in the intervening period. Let me put it this way: that that wouldn't be what you were trying to achieve. Closure of schools. But I, th I think we're finished with that line of question. Mr. Bartley's made it quite clear that he, he's speaking as a head of the, re the review group. Sorry, are you finished again? Uh, yes. Right, thanks very much. Uh, Andy, you wanted to come in and then, uh, Ale and Alice, Alexander, do you want to come in as well? Okay. Yes, and it was just br very briefly following up the, the schools question. Um, I'm just curious how you approached this question. You said it was because of levelling the playing field. So was that a, was that a, um, was that? A, I mean, I noticed the the um, at the outset you agreed to embed as far as possible principles of fairness, consistency, transparency, simplicity, and accountability. So presumably this comes under the heading of fairness. Uh, you're levelling the playing field. I, I'm not sure I allocated a principle to every recommendation. No, but it was levelling the playing field. Yeah. So were you looking across the whole rating system? and seeing where there were potential uneven playing fields, as it were, between similar properties in the same sector, for example? Or did, did the independent schools um, arise as a specific... Did someone suggest that they would should pay rates? Or were you looking at all the different reliefs to see how much money could be generated by changing them? Or I mean, how did you arrive at beginning to consider this question? Well, um... I can't remember whether there was a moment in time when it was felt that that was an appropriate uh, basis on which to to, to 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 put this on on the table, as it were. Um, and we certainly didn't. We, whilst we were aware of all the reliefs that were available, we didn't we didn't start to reverse engineering solutions into wherever the largest reliefs were, because it was just a question of what are the facts of what sort of facts available to us. It was really quite a, quite a just a simple question of saying is this is this fair. Is it fair that uh, independent schools and state schools uh, are, are treated in a different way as far as the payment of non-domestic rates is concerned? And we concluded that they should be, um, and therefore, as a consequence of that, made that recommendation to Mr Mackay. So if, if, if I were to put it to you, one of your remit included um, the instruction that your recommendation should be revenue neutral, broadly speaking. So if I put it to you that some of your key recommendations that were designed to boost economic activity involved the reduction in uh, rates liability, therefore there would be a reduction in income, you had to find some money to make up that reduction to ensure revenue neutrality. Um, so if I put it to you that you, you looked at all the reliefs that existed to find out whether they were capable of being tweaked or abolished or in part abolished, was that, is that, would that be a fair characterisation or did you, would that not? Uh, that, would, that would be a fair, a reasonable characterisation of, of the, the process through which we, we went. We looked at all reliefs and, and, and had to determine whether or not um, they were providing an appropriate level of economic stimulus or they were, were actually fair. Okay, and it would be fair also to say that you didn't go into 
examining these release. For example, the Small Business Bonus Scheme, you decided that rather than tinker with that, you would recommend a review of that. Um, but you didn't go into huge detail on all these reliefs, presumably, given the amount of work that would have been involved. Well, it depends what you mean by huge. I mean, if, if you could give me an example, I think it might help, um, and I can respond to a specific question rather than a, a generalisation. Well, to say so the empty property relief, for example, did you gather a wide range of evidence and analyse the numbers and look at it over time and all that kind of analytical work that would be required to evaluate whether it was still a relief that was justified or not? That, that's a fair point. I think uh, in addition to the report, which you will no doubt have seen and read, there is a plethora of um, additional information that's publicly available. Um, it, there are there's reams of reports in there that you can uh, review and, and, and establish the work that was undertaken. But I think it would be fair to say that over a relatively short period, which was the time of the review from um, the, around about 14, 15 months, we were able to look back and, and did look back to, to establish some facts. But of course, we weren't reviewing something over a long period of time. You could argue that there's many of the recommendations that, that we've made uh, that um, would would have some of the other, some of some of the other recommendations that we set, felt we could have made but didn't that are at the back of this report would undoubtedly have fallen into that category of requiring significantly longer uh, time to, to to determine, for example, land value tax. You, we couldn't possibly have come up with a, a fully blown recommendation for to change the fundamentals of non-domestic rates to a land value tax in the time frame that we had available because for example it needs to be brought into it needs to be looked at with council tax at the, as well so there, there, there were crossover issues like that that clearly would have required us significantly longer to uh, to come to a conclusion and, we, and we've mentioned many of those in, in the appendices of our report okay thanks very much so in some sense in some senses um this should not be seen as the end, this legislation, it, it perhaps given the challenges. I mean, I don't know if you looked at town centres specifically versus out of town retail, um, but is there, I mean, is there anything within the rate system, non-domestic rates that could assist? Because I, I know the last panel talked about the, the um, powers that local authorities have to exempt areas within town centres, but that of course costs money. They have to pay for that, which they've not got. Can the rate system or, or some form of a taxation help town centres? Recommended, and I, and I, from recollection, believe that uh, Mr Mackay adopted our recommendation around Fresh Start, which was exactly to encourage the use of empty properties in town centres. In fact, I, I believe he may well have gone further than we did. We might, we might well have gone further at the time, but we were not in a position to do so because it would have cost us more money than we had available from the changes that we were making. So um, you know, I, I think Fresh Start was a very good example of where we were endeavouring to, to find ways of um, occupying empty premises, particularly in town centres. We had COSLA and the they were keen to stress, and it's back to my point, like this legislation is coming through just now, but do we need to look again? Because they were keen to stress that there's this review that the Finance Secretary announced um, where they're looking at council tax. I mean, should, 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 should non-domestic rates be looked at as part of a wider review? It was made to, to look at... Um, uh, uh, devolve taxes in the round, then that would clearly be a decision that was made for, for the government of the day. And it's certainly not my position to uh, give, give a particular view on, on whether or not a further review of non-domestic rates needs to be undertaken. Um, okay. And finally, can I ask you, I mean, I, I know you'll say, well, it was a recommendation, but the alios, back to your question earlier about, about fairness, the principle of fairness, is it not is it right for ministers to pick and choose what's fair and not fair, but my understanding is that, that the main reason the government did not proceed with ALOs is the impact on local authority budgets would have been quite devastating. What was your take on, on, on that? So your, your question is, why, why did we make that recommendation? Um, I, I think I can probably best capture it by uh, admittedly an anecdote. Um, but, 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 but by some fact, which if, if I remember, I'll come back to in a moment. 
Um, we had an evidence session at which one of the uh, deputy leaders of a fairly significant council attended, and she uh, was very clear in saying that the only reason that we put these public assets into Alios is to reduce the tax rate that is due and payable on them. Otherwise, we wouldn't. So that, to my mind, was an opportunity for us to look at this and say, well, is this fair? Uh, and we concluded that it was something that needed to be addressed, and that's why the recommendations that we made, uh, as we made to, to ministers. Just going back to the, the facts, if you look at one of the charts, I, I'm afraid I can't remember, because I, um, you know, if I'd been able to go through this several times in the time I had available, I would re remember the, the exact uh, paragraph. But if you look at the charitable relief that is, is, has increased. If you look at all the, re we, we, do, we chart over several years the amount of relief that, that's made available to the various categories. And the far and far and away the biggest one is charitable relief. And it's not the charitable relief that the, my, uh, the predecessor in here is talking about. This is charitable relief going to Alios. And the number, the amount of assets that were being moved from local authorities into Alios over, over a relatively short number of years. Was, was, was very considerable, and we felt that uh, that, that was not appropriate and that uh, it needed to be addressed. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank thanks. you very much. Alexander, do you want to Can I just pick up once again? A little bit on the, on the school, and then I'll go on to something else. I understand and acknowledge why you chose to. You've talked about the fairness and equity, making sure they were equal and there was equity across the piece between the independent sector uh, and the state sector. During all of that, how much analysis did you do about what potential knock-on effect there might be to the state sector if the independent sector was, uh, as my, my colleague Mr Simpson has indicated, uh, there may be knock-on effects about the viability of some of those, those schools? Um, I don't think it was appropriate for us to do the analysis of individual uh, independent schools to determine whether or not the impact of this uh, change um, uh, was going to have such a devastating effect. I, I mean, I think I think it's probably worthwhile giving some context for for the the the, the panel, and that context is that um, there are about thirty five thousand at the time of writing this report. There are about thirty five thousand um, pupils at independent schools in Scotland. Our assessment um, of the work that was done, and and that again is publicly available in the archive is that it would bring in round about £5 million. Um, that equates to about £150 per pupil per annum, um, at, in addition to the, uh, the the fees that are payable. The average fees in Scotland are around £12,000 a year, so it's 1.25% uh, over and above that, which they're, they're currently paying. Uh, in that context, um, that was enough for us to say that shouldn't be, uh, uh, that shouldn't be enough to... To, um, to, to make them uh, unable to either pass that fee on or absorb some of that themselves. Some locations, just because of the location, for example, here at Edinburgh, has a much larger percentage of, of private uh, uh, schools, independent schools. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, they collectively uh, have a, a bigger potential burden on the local authority if things don't work out within this whole sector here in Edinburgh or somewhere else like Perth and Kinross uh, that once again has a larger sector of that community. Uh, and did you, you look at that when you were, when you were looking in the round? I, 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 th I think I've explained what, what we looked at and um, you know, if, if further analysis needed to be done following our recommendation, I, I, I believe that that was ultimately for, for ministers to determine what was appropriate um, or not. And moving on to another subject, your, your, your recommendations, some people have been in their submissions to us as we've gone on through this process, they've talked about a, a additional burdens that may well happen in local authority, that may well happen in the assessors. Uh, uh, was, was that your intention at that stage, that you, you envisaged that that would be the case, that, that by having some of these recommendations you would be adding extra burdens or, 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 or pushing on to local authorities uh, information that, that would give them that extra I think in, in every, in every, uh, if you if you if you check that the the 30 recommendations that we made, some of them will have a quantifiable amount that was either costing uh, the, the the taxpayer or was was being relieved to the taxpayer. Many of the administrative recommendations that we made um, were exactly that administered. So so uh, and we make a comment on that that says yes, th this this is not material, but we recognise that there will be administ additional administrative burdens placed on either the assessors or the local authorities to ensure that this is implemented. Okay, thank you. Kenny. 
Yes, uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Barclay. Um, just uh, following on from the previous panel, I'm just interested in the, the issue of uh, charitable uh, rate relief for charity shops. I'm just wondering why you decided to st the 80% should be retained and not it shouldn't go to 100% and even <coughs> drop to 60 or 50%. What was the kind of thinking behind that? I mean, obviously you've heard the evidence about the you know, enthusiasm for it being 100%. But I just wonder why you felt 80% was ex the right figure. Um, I, that that was that was what was um, effectively a central, as I recall, a central government uh, agreement that they would subsidise down to eighty percent. Then it was the, the 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 it was then with the local authority as to whether that additional twenty percent. My, my recollection is the additional twenty percent. Um, uh, as far as I was concerned, that was that was that was okay, and uh, we we concluded that that was a perfectly legitimate uh, rate to alleviate the charity shops of, and 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 then recommended no change. Yeah. Okay. So you didn't feel there was a strong enough argument to go to one hundred percent relief, for example. Yeah. We did speak to them in an evidence session, um, and they put forward their point of view, and and we decided that the um, the status quo was 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 entirely appropriate. And why was that, that the status quo was entirely appropriate? Because the previous, um, uh, um, you know, Rachel Blair, um, on behalf of the sector, said that that, that obviously meant that some local uh, charity shops struggle uh, with, with that rate, scene with the 20%, where the council doesn't provide that relief. Um, to, to, to be honest, Mr Gibson, I am struggling to remember um, the reason as to why we determined that 80% was not uh, was was the right number, not 100. I think if you, if you'll forgive me, it would be appropriate for me to respond formally to that, if if you would, through through Mr. Dornan, um, and and uh, and clarify our thinking, if, if that would be okay. That'd be I, I just it's two years ago. I've, I've forgotten the Feel exact understand. detail of it. Thanks very much. Thank you. Yes, I mean, you know, uh, okay. uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Barclay. Uh, two. Uh, I think relatively quick questions. One was uh, an issue that was raised in the written submission from the Scottish Retail Consortium uh, 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 to the committee, but actually wasn't uh, discussed today. And given your expertise, I just thought it might be in order to uh, pose the question. And they talk about the deposit return scheme and the need, uh, therefore, for uh, shops to have store refits and pur purchase potentially reverse vending machines. And they say that they're concerned that these changes could be classed as improvements uh, and consequently impact on rateable value. In, in broad brush, is that a realistic concern or is that perhaps over-egging it? I, I, um, I, 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 I'm, not, I think it's, I'm, not, I'm not sure I know the answer to that question, to be, to be honest with you. Um, what, what I did recommend, what our, my commission did recommend, was that we asked the government to review plant machinery in some considerable detail. Uh, I, and I don't know whether or not anything has happened there, but we felt that the, the complexities around improvements were so complicated and the expertise didn't exist within my group to determine what was the right way forward. And secondly, the last time a plant machinery review had taken place, it took them, I believe, two or three years to reach the conclusions and recommendations that they did. And therefore, I don't think it was, in, it was, it was appropriate for us to try and to, to, to cram that into the time that we had available. And that was the reason that we made a recommendation. I think that's the sort, if, if that is something that the, the government decided that they want to pursue, then it seems entirely appropriate that the example you've given be included in the plant machinery review for, um, for all businesses. That's very interesting. Thank you for that. And just a, a last question. Um, so. We had your report, the recommendations, we've got the, the bill, we're going through that. There will probably be some tweaks to that, I would imagine. That is ever the, the process in this Parliament uh, to get the best legislation that we can. The legislation then gets passed. How long do you think it is before we'll need a Barclay 2 review? <laughs> well, in, in, uh, in the spirit in which that was intended, I trust that it won't be Barclay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Just, just, just going back to the the schools um, issue, and you you use the word fairness quite a lot. So one of the recommendations, and I think it's actually in the bill, is that some independent schools uh, will will retain relief. You know, like mu music schools. So why why some and not others? Why 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 yeah? Why not schools that specialise in sport or science or 
that may be a question for the government, Mr Simpson. I, I don't remember identifying a music school or the music school in Scotland as receiving particular, particularly different treatment. So um, I certainly don't recall that, and, uh, and I think that's one for, for ministers when they um, speak to you. Well, does it pass your fairness test? Well, it, I, I think... I, can, can I just reiterate what I said? I made my recommendations to government at the time. Uh, whatever they have decided to do or change in the intervening period is a matter for them. My brief was to deliver this but within, one, within 14 months, and that was what I did. And, and uh, I'm really here to answer questions about the recommendations that I made rather than the opinions of others uh, subsequent to that time. Much. Uh, thanks very much for attending today's session, Mr. Bartley. That was that was very helpful indeed. Uh, I further evidence session will take place in the bill at our next meeting on the fourth of September, when we will hear from the Scottish government. So I suspend briefly to allow the witness to leave the table. Uh, agenda, agenda item three is a consideration of negative instruments 195 and 204 as listed on the agenda. I refer members to paper number three, which contains further details. The instruments are laid under the negative procedure, which means that the provisions will come into force unless the Parliament agrees to a motion to annul them and no motions to annul have been laid. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee considered instrument 195 at its meeting on 18th of June 2019 and determined that they do not need to draw the attention of the Parliament to the instrument on any grounds within its remit. The DPLR committee considered instrument 204 at its meeting on 18th of June 2019. It reported that the instrument does not respect the rule that at least 28 days should elapse between the laying of a negative instrument and the coming into the force of the instrument. The committee considered this to be acceptable in the circumstances, given that the instrument is largely corrective action in response to minor errors in instrument 161 previously considered by this committee. The DPLR committee noted that the corrective instrument before us today will allow the associated regulations to come into force on the intended date of 28th of June 2019. Do members have any comments on the instrument? Okay. I therefore invite the committee to agree that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to these instruments. Are we agreed? Agreed. Yeah. Thank you. That ends the public part of the meeting. I now move this meeting into private. Right. Thanks, Andy.